NASA wants ideas on how to speed up the return of its astronauts to the surface of the moon. And now, Blue Origin might have some to offer. But first, huge congratulations to Blue Origin for successfully landing its massive New Glenn booster for the very first time. The rocket not only launched an interplanetary mission on just its second flight, but it also stuck an impressive landing at sea. NASA's two-spacecraft escapade mission is officially on its way to Mars after a clean liftoff on November 13th aboard New Glenn, Blue Origin's next-generation heavy-lift rocket. After launch, the first stage carried out a series of deceleration burns and touched down on the recovery ship Jacqueline, stationed about 375 miles 604 kilometers, out in the Atlantic. This rocket is a big deal for Blue Origin's future lunar plans, too. New Glenn is expected to play a key role in launching the company's upcoming moon lander. Anyway, like I mentioned earlier, NASA is rethinking its approach to the moon. A few weeks ago, NASA reached out to SpaceX and Blue Origin, both key players in the Artemis program, and asked if they could come up with alternative lunar lander designs for Artemis 3 that might be quicker to build. In a post on its website, SpaceX went into detail about what it's achieved so far. But there's still one big hurdle ahead. It hasn't yet demonstrated the tricky process of transferring millions of gallons of liquid methane and liquid oxygen between two starships in orbit. That step is essential before the starship lander can top off its tanks and head to the moon. Blue Origin, meanwhile, is working on a lander for a later Artemis mission. It's smaller than Starship, but it also depends on in-space refueling. Realistically, NASA's current 2027 target for a lunar landing looks ambitious, maybe even unrealistic, given how complex both the SpaceX and Blue Origin approaches are. But Blue Origin might have something that could touch down on the moon a bit sooner. Dave Limp, Blue Origin's CEO, recently hinted at what's ahead, saying, I'm not going to get into the details, that's really for NASA to talk about, not us. But we do have some ideas that could help speed up the path to the moon, and I hope NASA takes a close look. Their new proposal to NASA combines the larger lander with a smaller test version called Blue Moon Mark I, which is designed to validate key technologies. The first Blue Moon Mark I mission is set to launch next year on Blue Origin's massive New Glenn rocket. What's interesting is that Blue Origin's updated Artemis III plan skips the whole in-space propellant transfer step entirely. That simpler, more direct approach could be ready for a 2028 mission and would avoid some of the risks tied to unproven technology. Blue Origin hasn't revealed all the details yet, but that just makes it more intriguing. So let's take a closer look at what they might be planning and what it could mean for the next moon landing. Blue Moon Mark I, powered by a single BE-7 engine, is an autonomous lunar lander designed to deliver and support cargo on the moon's surface. The Mark I stands about 8.05 meters tall and 3.08 meters in diameter, with a fully fueled mass of roughly 21,350 kilograms. It can carry up to 3,000 kilograms of payload, enough for things like lunar rovers or even a base station that could serve as a power and communications hub for future missions. Now, to carry crew, the Mark I would need some major modifications. Even though it's smaller than the planned Mark II or SpaceX's Starship, it's still significantly larger than Apollo's lunar module. So in theory, if it had a solid life support system, it could work. But here's where things get tricky. Unlike Apollo, this new system has to rendezvous with another spacecraft, Orion, in a near-rectilinear halo orbit in RHO. That maneuver eats up a lot of fuel and requires a hefty amount of delta-v. So the big question is, how do we make that feasible? How do we get a modified Mark I out to Orion, or set up a reliable rendezvous in NRHO so astronauts can transfer over, land on the moon, and then return to orbit for the trip home? Well, it might need a little support, probably from another Mark I lander. If you had a second vehicle that was pre-positioned and landed somewhere away from the first one, but not too far, you could actually make this work. So how would that look in practice? First, the primary Mark I, the landing version, rendezvous with Orion in near-rectilinear halo orbit. The two astronauts transfer over to the lander, and it descends to the lunar surface. Meanwhile, the second Mark I, the ascent version, would have been delivered straight to the moon ahead of time, without bothering with an NRHO rendezvous. It would land separately, but close enough to the first Mark I for the crew to reach it after completing their surface mission. 
this ascent lander would have enough fuel left to lift off, return to NRHO, and rendezvous with Orion for the trip home. The downside is that this approach would require a lot of hardware and launches for just one mission though still less than what a full in-orbit refueling setup would take. And, of course, that doesn't leave much room for extra cargo. On the upside, this could be a faster path to getting boots back on the moon, potentially even before China does. Plus, that second lander could carry some useful gear or experimental equipment, laying the groundwork for future, larger missions. Another interesting idea is that Blue Origin's Blue Moon Mark I lunar lander might be ready for crewed missions sooner than expected especially if it's paired with an upgraded version of the New Glenn rocket. Originally, New Glenn was announced with the ability to lift about 45 tons to low Earth orbit in its reusable configuration. But during its first test flight, it only managed around 25 tons, likely because the BE-4 engines weren't generating as much thrust as planned. To close that gap, Blue Origin could either increase each engine's thrust or add more engines, maybe bumping the count from 7 up to 9. Doing so could give New Glenn a big performance boost and help speed up the timeline for lunar missions. If New Glenn eventually reaches its original 45-ton payload goal, then in an expendable configuration, where the booster isn't recovered, it might be able to launch over 60 tons. That's a game-changer. It would allow the Blue Moon Mark I to travel directly from Earth orbit to the Moon's near-rectilinear halo orbit and then land on the lunar surface all in a single mission. No need for orbital refueling or multiple launches like the larger Mark II version requires. To handle the translunar injection burn, Blue Origin could add a third stage, like the ICPS from the Delta IV Heavy or Centaur V. That said, given how efficient New Glenn's Hydrolox upper stage is expected to be, a third stage might not even be necessary, especially for payloads in the 25-ton range. The Blue Moon Mark I itself already has enough Delta V to make a full round trip between NRHO and the lunar surface while carrying up to 3 tons of payload. The next step would be designing a crewed capsule that fits within that 3-ton limit. That's absolutely feasible. After all, the Apollo Lunar Module's crew cabin had a dry mass of just about 2 tons. And finally, here's a pretty wild idea. Blue Origin might even bring back the original Blue Moon lander design from 2019. Remember when Jeff Bezos unveiled a full-scale mock-up of the older lander? It looked quite different from the version Blue Origin is developing today. Like today's design, it used the hydrogen-fueled BE-7 engine, another Blue Origin project. But the 2019 Blue Moon was shorter and squatter. Despite its size, it was still a very capable lander able to touch down precisely on the lunar surface with 3.6 metric tons, about 7,936 pounds, of cargo. A stretched tank variant could land up to 6.5 metric tons, 14,330 pounds. It had four landing legs that could fold up to fit within the 23-foot-wide, 7-meter, payload envelope of the New Glenn rocket. Bezos envisioned it as a flexible landing platform for all sorts of missions, scientific experiments, cargo pods, or robotic rovers. The stretched version would even be able to carry astronauts inside a pressurized compartment, along with an ascent stage to take the crew back off the moon. The deck is designed to be a very simple interface so that a great variety of payloads can be placed onto the top deck and secured, Bezos said. A davit crane, similar to ones on naval ships, could lower equipment from the lander's top deck to the lunar surface. The lander would also feature laser-ranging sensors to map its landing zone in real time, allowing the onboard computer to match terrain against a preloaded map and land with precision of 75 feet, about 25 meters, or better. It could safely touch down on inclines up to 15 degrees, and it would carry a laser communications package to beam data back to Earth. This is the rendering of the human-rated version, but honestly, the chance Blue brings this idea back is pretty slim. So far, work on both the Blue Moon Mark I and Mark II landers is still ongoing. Both are powered by Blue Origin's BE-7 engines, which are arguably one of the most critical pieces of the program. These engines are being tested on stands across Alabama, Texas, and Washington. A while back, Blue Origin CEO Dave Limp shared a 17-minute video of a hot fire test in Texas. This test was meant to simulate the Apogee Rays maneuver for the Mark I lander, the longest burn the engine needs to perform to reach the moon. Interestingly, the engine used in this test didn't have a nozzle, showing that the BE-7 is tested for both vacuum and atmospheric conditions. Both landers use a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, 
not just because it's one of the most energetic propellant mixes, but also because it powers the reaction control system and the onboard fuel cells. The moon's night lasts two weeks and it gets extremely cold. The fuel cells provide about 2.5 kilowatts of power, which would otherwise require a huge solar array. Blue Origin explained, we use fuel cells for the lunar night and solar arrays for the day, but eventually we plan to move to regenerative fuel cells, which will allow us to perform electrolysis of water to generate power and propellant. Liquid hydrogen has to be stored at super cold temperatures, around minus 200 degrees Celsius, minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, to keep it from boiling off into gas. Any hydrogen that does turn into gas is routed through the lander's liquid oxygen tanks, which are also kept at cryogenic temperatures to prevent them from warming and boiling off. Blue Origin has spent the last several years developing and refining its cryogenic cooling capabilities. Using protoflight hardware, they've achieved 90 Kelvin and 20 Kelvin in lab environments. And there are some big milestones coming up. Over the summer, they worked closely with NASA's on an intensive test campaign to advance these systems. Additionally, the Blue Origin utility transfer mechanism was recently tested inside the TS-300 thermal vacuum chamber at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. According to Blue Origin, the lunar transporter will use propellant tanks similar to those on the New Glenn rocket. Like the landers, the lunar transporter will rely on seven BE-7 engines for its main propulsion. Both the Lunar Transporter and the Blue Moon Mark II are being built at Lunar Plant 1, part of Blue Origin's Rocket Park campus in Florida. While the spacecraft are coming together, Blue Origin is also collaborating with NASA on the habitation module for Blue Moon Mark II, which is designed to carry two astronauts on their journey from the lunar surface back to the Gateway, the International Lunar Space Station being developed by NASA and its partners. Once the current federal government shutdown ends, NASA plans to consider additional lunar lander proposals, not just from Blue Origin or SpaceX. Bethany Stevens, NASA's press secretary, said, A committee of NASA subject matter experts will be assembled to evaluate each proposal and determine the best path forward to win the second space race, given the urgency of adversarial threats to peace and transparency on the moon. One potential proposal could come from Lockheed Martin, Company officials have said they've been collaborating with other aerospace partners for several months on a design that leverages existing technologies and even parts already made for other spacecraft. But that's a story for another day.